thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words, uh, Laura, and to everybody that's on here. We know taking time out of your busy days and so on is a really big deal. So hopefully your investment in time will be really worth it. So when they originally asked me if I would moderate this uh, track, they said, be yourself, have fun. Okay, so with that, maybe I can, uh, uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to share a little personal perspective as we kick this thing off. Um, so in uh, being out of the, the West Coast, California region, in October 89, I was inside a major refinery during the, uh, in Richmond, California, during the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, things were going very bad. My entire team was on the upper bridge, upper deck of the Bay Bridge when it was breaking, and I was on the Cypress structure three times that day. Fast forward in April of 92, I temporarily moved to manage a project in Pacoima, California. Gee, the day before the riot started. Uh, March 2011, one of my advanced technologies team had built and deployed the tsunami warning buoy system across the Pacific Rim. We watched the waves in real time from the Fukushima earthquake travel around the Pacific Rim before they impacted the coastal communities. April of 2013, my critical infrastructure protection team, advanced technologies, was one of the first calls of morning. Some bad folks decided to take out the Metcalf station in San Jose. We were asked what technologies could be aided to better uh, help with uh, real-time situational awareness and better coordinate our responses in the future. And finally, our uh, cabin near Chester, California, base of uh, Mount Lassen uh, survived, but we were completely surrounded by the Dixie wildfire. It hit uh, north of a million acres. It was amazing to watch that nobody actually died in that major event that engulfed several rural communities. So the point to all this is as nuanced as the conditions were on the ground for each one of these events, uh, everyone had some, one thing in common, a strong need to evolve in our response capabilities. And I shared this because I have a firsthand appreciation for the major advances in technologies since Loma Prieta. So supporting real-time situational awareness, informed operational decision-making, and public and private collaboration in the time of need. So, you know, the technology, it's amazing. It's a force multiplier. At the same time, I believe there was a comment yesterday by one of the directors yesterday morning who said, this is all about people, people, and people. And then I think it was uh, the illustrious director, Bud Mertz, out of Westmoreland, who said his superpower is in the handshake. Everyone participating in the resilience exchange uh, here, it, it's geared around both of those with one proviso. It's relationships first, but then being able to leverage technologies that function as an amazing enabler. So it helps to make really bad days a little less bad. So this is an amazing group. Thank you everybody for being here today. I just wanted to kind of set the stage. Um, so aside from the fact that the state of California is probably really glad that I moved out of the state since I seem to be their, uh, their bad luck charm, um, it, I wanted to toss out an honorable uh, shout out to our first group of panelists. The Paradise Campfire also happened in my front yard. I have a number of friends who live there. And they said point blank, after, while the recovery was going on, they said if it wasn't for the compassionate and diligent work of the FEMA team, from Verizon disaster recovery teams and several others that we could go on all day who should get uh, good recognition here. They would, they would have had to take their clothes on their back and leave what was left of their homes and their lives in the rear view mirror. So just wanted to pro provide the shout out here. So with that said, um, our, the title of our first segment here is Federal Support to Disaster Response, how FEMA and DHS CISA work together to support regional and national disasters. Uh, with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce two of the best in the business. We have on the line, Bob Rudledge, Emergency Support Function ESF-14 with CISA, the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency. And we have Ron Robbins, Operations and Insights Management Branch Chief at FEMA. So gents, uh, over to you. And uh, again, thank you everybody for participating. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Ron Robbins. Uh, great to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to the group. Um, we're working through a couple technology challenges, uh, trying to get Mr. Rutledge into the into the call. So we'll uh, 
I'll move forward a little bit. I'll just give a quick kind of overview of background of Mr. Rutledge and I'll move on to myself. Um, Bob is the, uh, is the ESF uh, 14 section chief within, uh, within CISA, uh, the response operations branch, uh, which is responsible uh, for ESFs 2 and 14. Um, Bob's been with DHS since 2004. Uh, first, first working as a contractor and then transitioning to federal service in 2008. Uh, just a little bit of, of my background. I am uh, retired from the military, uh, 28 years of service in the United States Army, uh, joined FEMA in 2014, uh, currently uh, assigned to the Office of Business Industry and Infrastructure Integration Office at, at FEMA, and working, as, as Del mentioned, as the Operations Insight Management Branch Chief. Uh, and also manage the National Business Emergency Operations Center during uh, disaster uh, response operations. Um, a quick overview of, of what lies ahead for us and FEMA uh, this year and some of our initiatives. Uh, today, we're pleased to discuss ESF 14 in depth and the ways that both FEMA and CISA partner with business, industry, and infrastructure entities to safeguard critical lifelines and assist with swift restoration of business and economic stability after, after disaster strike. Our work is focused on fostering meaningful and operational relationships with business partners and industry stakeholders before, during, and after disasters. Because when businesses get back to business, communities recover faster. Additionally, uh, by enabling businesses to meet the needs of survivors, FEMA can focus on social on the social vulnerability as well. We want to continually help and improve response and recovery recovery outcomes through our work by providing actionable information on the cascading impacts to lifelines and supply chains. We do this by being responsive in collecting and sharing useful information and working to make this fast and easy for our partners. Our presentation will discuss ESF-14, what it is, what ESF-14 does during response operations, and provide a few examples from this most recent hurricane season, I don't need your help. and an introduction to FEMA's National Business Emergency Operations Center, the way forward for ESF-14, and some contact points and resources. Uh, next slide, please. Ron, this is Bob. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, fantastic. All right. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we had some technical difficulties here at Troubleshooting. I was able to dial in. So, um, Ron, if you don't mind, I'll I'll go over slide two. We're on uh, what ESF 14 is all about, correct? You're on mute, Ron. Sorry, Laura, can you back up one slide? Yep, you got it. Okay, all right, go ahead, Bob. So uh, the slide that we're looking at now should be uh, ESF 14 cross-sector business infrastructure, correct? Roger. Yes, sir. Fantastic, all right. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, sorry about all that. My name is Bob Rutledge. I'm with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about ESF 14. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with ESF 14, but uh, we're gonna give you a short overview uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So the National Response Framework, which is how the, the nation responds to emergencies, uh, identifies 15 emergency support functions, or ESFs for short. And those ESFs are depicted on the left-hand side by that. Um, they're listed. It starts with transportation. It ends with external affairs. And just above external affairs, you see highlighted uh, larger than the rest is cross-sector business and infrastructure. Now, that is ESF number 14, 14 out of 15. And we are the newest of the uh, emergency support functions. We were established in October of 2019 with the release of the National Response Framework, fourth edition. And that work was really a result of the after-action reports from the 2017 hurricane season. And that after action report indicated there was a need to have a mechanism or a catalyst to mesh federal and private sector 
capabilities during response operations. So that's part of the SF-14's mission. The other part is those same after action reports indicated there was a need for an ESF to be the voice for business and infrastructure operators who are not already aligned to one of the other ESFs that you see depicted on your screen. So for example, uh, electric power companies, they're already aligned to ESF number 12, which is energy. So we serve as the voice for those that aren't already aligned to one of the other ESFs. So ESF 14 aligns and facilitates cross-sector operations among infrastructure owners and operators, businesses, and government partners so that we can bridge some of these gaps and facilitate closer, more coordinated engagement during disaster response. Um, our focus is primarily to help stabilize the seven community lifelines, also stabilize critical supply chains, and any impacted national critical functions. So this is really a team effort. Um, as you heard, Ron is with FEMA, I am with CISA, and uh, CISA and FEMA share primary agency status for ESF-14, which means that when ESF-14 is activated for a disaster response, the FEMA team where Ron, Ron works and the CISA team where I work, we come together and we jointly execute the emergency support function mission for 14. So, in addition to the FEMA team and the CISA team, uh, Ron's team is the Office of Business, Industry, and Infrastructure Integration. My team is the Emergency Response Operations Branch. When we merge together, we are supported by 15 federal agencies. Now, these agencies are identified in the ESF 14 Annex in the National Response Framework. But the reality is we'll work with any federal agency we have to to address the issue at hand. So the real key though to this ESF is working with our partners, our business and infrastructure owners and operators so that we can mitigate um, issues, respond to cross-sector risks and impacts and uh, so forth. So we do a lot of partnering with private sector organizations such as the one hosting the show today, the All Hazards Consortium. Uh, we also partner with the National Council of Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, and we leverage extensive public and private sector contact lists that are maintained by Ron's team over at FEMA. And within CISA, we have a division called the Stakeholder Engagement Division, and they have a very large Rolodex on who to reach out to in the private sector. Now, there has been a lot of discussion about what ESF-14 really is, so I just want to take a moment and clarify a couple things. Uh, we are not a super ESF designed to direct the actions of the other ESFs. Believe it or not, that was a concern early on. Um, I think after three years of pandemic and multiple hurricanes, we've gotten past that at this point. But uh, ESF-14 will get involved when there are multiple sectors involved or impacted such as with supply chain issues, for example. Um, if coordination is required across multiple ESFs, we will help orchestrate that. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, if a business or infrastructure partner is not already clearly aligned to another ESF, or if they are and they just don't know it, we will facilitate that. Now we will defer to another ESF if the entities involved already have a relationship with another ESF. Again, we don't wanna step on their toes we will channel the, uh, the individual or the company organization to the proper ESF if we feel like they need to go to another ESF. Um, if we identify one of the emergency support functions has a particular expertise or has handled this problem in the past, we will defer to them. And finally, if there's very limited or no cross-sector impacts or the impacts are unclear, uh, we will do what we can to assist, but uh, we will take a supporting role. And if we could go to the next slide, please. All right, so situational awareness and coordination. And really, what can we do for you and how do we facilitate greater situational awareness and engagement amongst our partners? Um, first, as I mentioned, we serve as the conduit into the national response effort for those folks who are not already aligned to another emergency support function. 
and many of you may have attended our during events or incidents responses, we will host the ESF-14 Business and Infrastructure Stakeholder Call. Uh, we also call this the broad audience call because we will invite um, anyone is allowed to attend. It's just we prefer no media attention. So any business and infrastructure partner is welcome to attend. The invitations uh, are stamped for widest dissemination. But at the beginning of the calls, either I will say or Ron will say, whoever's the moderator, will say this is not intended for the media. The media inquiries need to go through the proper channels. So those calls are an information push. We'll give an update from uh, some of the lifelines, uh, usually a weather update as well, and we'll let the audience know what's going on, what, what the response effort looks like, how the lifelines are being impacted or the supply chains are being act impacted. Then we usually reserve about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the call. It's a one hour block for any question and answers from the audience or um, what someone once said, issue spotting. So if somebody in the audience has an issue and they need to bring it to our attention, that's their opportunity to present it during that call and we can get into the system with uh, whatever the issue may be. Uh, we've had a few of these calls where we've had over a thousand participants, but really routinely, I would say it's between 300 and 500 participants and uh, usually more participants at the beginning, say for like at a hurricane. And uh, as we go through day by day, we tend to see things dropping off as response efforts transition to recovery. So that's one of the things we do. We also convene sector specific calls or we can convene calls with sector risk management agencies or SRMAs for short. And that's to address a particular issue. That way we can get the needed group of people together, connect the relevant public and private sector partners and work through whatever problem has been identified. ESF 14 also serves as a gateway for all the CISA and FEMA resources that are available, both you know, during response operations, but, but even daily, daily routine operations or what some people call blue skies. Now, Ron's team maintains the National Business Emergency Operations Center or NBEOC for short. And they have a dashboard, which is a tremendous online resource available 24 seven. And there you can go to that dashboard online and see products specific to an incident, such as supply chain and response planning products, as well as the NBEOC snapshot. There's an example of it there on the slide. And the snapshot is a regular reoccurring quick update on the incident. And the MVOC dashboard also allows partners to submit questions and see responses to previous questions. So it's really is a tremendous asset uh, that uh, you can reach out to online. Now, last of all, for um, reaching out and so forth, um, Ron's team hosts a monthly touch point with their business and industry partners. And on the CISA side of the house, we host monthly meetings with the sector risk management agencies. And that helps us maintain situational awareness on how things are going. So if we're heading into hurricane season and already we know a particular supply chain is being stressed and a hurricane will likely further stress that supply chain, we, we would like to know about that ahead of time. So those venues help us keep informed. So next slide, please. So we wanted to give you all some examples of what ESF-14 has done or capable of doing. And uh, we had Hurricane Ian in Florida last fall, and we have a couple of examples that we've drawn from uh, that experience to share with you all. Uh, first example is there was a short line railroad that was uh, the sole rail line for southwestern Florida. And this was from the area between Punta Gorda and down to Naples. And uh, for that, that one short line railroad, uh, they had a couple bridges that were, were down. The bridges had been destroyed. Um, the rail line was damaged. So this was not going to be an overnight fix. So we needed to start thinking about how do we get response supplies into that area if we're not able to move by rail? So we were looking at highway and barge traffic. Now, 
the value here is we didn't, ES-14 did not jump in there and help put those bridges back up. Where the value is on ES-14 was we were working with the American Association of Railroads to get a better understanding of the impact that this railroad being down was going to have on the area and response operations. And the American Association of Railroads, they did a fantastic job of letting us know just what the, that railroad did for a living in that area. So we were able to take that information and get that information to the Department of Transportation. We had a regional response team down in Florida that was a combination of CISA and FEMA personnel. And we got the information also to Florida state officials. And Florida state officials and the response teams down there did reach out to the owner operator of that railroad and started a dialogue. But again, it wasn't ESF-14 getting those bridges back up. It was ESF-14 leveraging our network with the private sector to really put into perspective for the people that were doing response operations in Florida to better understand what that short line railroad meant to a particular area. Now, similarly, we had a livestock feed issue on the northeastern coast of Florida. Uh, ESF-14 was uh, contacted by two uh, farmer associations requesting assistance, they wanted to ensure that railroad deliveries um, of livestock feed were going to reach the distribution points on schedule because they wanted to make sure that they still had uh, feed for their cattle and what other animals they had to take care of. So again, working with a lot of the same regional partners, the Florida state officials, Emergency support function number one, which is transportation. Emergency support function number 11, which is agriculture. And again, our, our good friends at the American Association of Railroads, we ensured the information got into the right hands for action. So those were two, two examples I wanted to share with you. And now I will pass it over to Ron Robbins for another example. And he's also going to provide some information on the National Business Emergency Operations Center, again, NBEOC for short. So Ron, over to you, please. Next slide. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, next slide, Laura. Thank you. Um, this slide uh, shows what was put together, again, as part of our Hurricane Ian response. It is a uh, grocery and mass care availability, uh, uh, ESRI, driven uh, web web portal or or depiction if you will with with multiple layers on there and on the on the right hand side you can see some of the data layers that are here and as both Dell and Bob mentioned already right we get these we get these uh, data feeds and data layers from both public and private partners right and it's all about the relationships right we don't get this information without having consistent and galvanized relationship with our industry partners. Um, and on this overlay here, some of the grocery store availability um, is, is ingested by our partners here at Publix and, and also by the state of Florida, right? Uh, state of Florida has a very robust relationship with private industry partners, and they also shared these data layers with us to enable us to put this, uh, to put this slide together, right? And, um, we uh, we work with FEMA's supply chain advisors in tandem through steady state and disaster activations as well. Our role is to monitor and gather feedback from the advisors and help inform uh, whether to ramp up or decrease uh, supplies and or to slow down the supplies and slow down the logistics stream um, from toppling over uh, private industry and businesses um, in in impacted areas, right? We don't want to cause harm, right? The idea here is for us to be able to, as part of this, is to be able to show where there are available grocery stores in proximity to impacted uh, locations and the, and the stores that are open, stores, uh, pharmacies, uh, locations where, where uh, disaster survivors can go and normal uh, economic activity is back underway, right? And by being able to show this, uh, FEMA leaders are able to have conversations with the federal coordinating officers and the state and local officials to give them a, a sense of where 
uh, economic activity is coming back into play. And again, that helps enables us to slow down the inflow of, of response related uh, commodities into the impacted areas and people can get back to normal economic activity or new normal economic activity in these impacted uh, areas. Um, we want to have a measured commodity response as possible to meet the needs while minimizing potentially or unused or unneeded resources uh, from just being uh, unnecessarily pushed into impacted areas. The entire time our focus remains on providing FEMA and our activated emergency response partners with business and industry information they need. So the agency and our response partners may focus on effectively supporting survivors and first responders. At the same time, we want our efforts to provide the right mix of information supporting businesses as they get back to business. Uh, the Hurricane Ian is a, is a recent example of where we focus those efforts in combining and monitoring supply chains and coordinating activities of our federal and state partners and critical business and industry sectors. ESF-14 was activated in tandem with the National Response Coordination Center to repair and respond prepare and respond to the communities in the path of Hurricane Ian. Uh, following the storm's impact, ESF-14 joined efforts with ESF-6 mass care, emergency assistance, temporary housing, health and human services, and focused on gathering information on grocery access and vulnerable, vulnerable populations affected in the disaster path. And you'll notice these layers noted here on the, on the right side, as I mentioned. Um, and again, this is a, this is an interactive map. So I, I'm sorry, this is just a static display of the picture, right? Which you, when you, in a, in the actual ArcGIS, you're able to actually scroll in and get down to more granular uh, depictions of the store locations and what stores are there in these in these bubbled areas. Uh, this interactive map was created using geographic information technology, and with our information provided by FEMA's Recovery Analytics Division, federal government partners, grocery stakeholders, and the state of Florida State Emergency Response Team, and others. Uh, to build this map, the emergency support functions jointly collected data from multiple partners to help provide a visual representation to inform the whole of government and response and stabiliza stabilization efforts. The information layers consist of data from mass care, as I mentioned, uh, FEMA individual assistance, uh, showing where disaster survivors are located and the damage was concentrated. Uh, USDA, uh, they provide us the supplemental nutrition assistance program data, which informs operating status of grocery store businesses and locations of vulnerable populations. Uh, CISA and the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, FSISAC for short, uh, we work closely with them uh, and we're, we're able to secure uh, credit and debit card transaction information, anonymized information from our from our credit card clearinghouse companies, uh, giving us and showing us the operation status of grocery and businesses using transactional uh, information points. Um, and also worked with our partners at SCAN, the Supply Chain Networks Act, Supply Chain uh, Active in, I, I always mess up the end part, uh, that's Gene Shearer and his group at FEMA who support the major retail partners and in information sharing and other tools as well, as well as grocery business and open and closed data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna give an overview now of the NBEOC. Uh, this was established in 2012 to enhance communication and collaboration with private industry partners and to ensure their integration into disaster operations at the st strategic and tactical level. In January, 2020, uh, the Office of Business, Industry, Infrastructure and Integration officially formed as an office and assumed operational responsibilities of the NBEOC. Uh, in February, 2020, OB3I activated the NBOC to support 24 seven response operations and the NRCC to support federal government's COVID-19 pandemic response. The MBOC worked directly with other FEMA offices and HHS to provide operational support to stakeholders around the country that had the capability to deliver and aid, aid and stabilize impacted supply chains. 
After two demanding years working on the pandemic response efforts, the MBOC transitioned to a steady state uh, operations in the spring of 2022. The MBOC now operates before, during, and after disasters. Uh, during activations, the OB3I operates the MBOC service desk uh, during disaster report, uh, disaster response operations. Sorry, and to coordinate with to coordinate with businesses, to cross share information on where resources are most needed to help businesses to get up and running faster. When businesses resume normal operation, the community is one step closer to recovery. The operation of, MB, of the MBOC during disaster response oper, operations include uh, connecting the dots between mutually beneficial lines of effort across the public and business and industry partners during emergency management operations. Also operating the MBOC service desk as a clearinghouse to answer requests for information and provide assistance to our stakeholders and persons seeking uh, additional information. We also provide near real time relevant information and data to support situational awareness and to provide products for uh, business decision makers uh, at FEMA. <clears throat> we also, as Bob mentioned, host cross sector business and industry calls during disasters to reach a wide audience of private sector uh, partners to share information in real time in an open forum into issue spot and identify needs to assist and respond to recovery efforts. Providing support, we also provide support to the FEMA regions uh, and our there are 10 FEMA regions, uh, regardless of whether it's a presidential disaster declaration or if it's some type of non-Stafford now, which we are starting to become used to uh, supporting uh, non-Stafford type declarations and, and support to both regions and state, local, and tribal uh, and territorial uh, authorities. An example is a, of this is if a storm hits a specific region and there's need to access uh, potable water, OB3I can coordinate with major retail chains to identify potential solutions and possible resources to provide support. <clears throat> we also provide updated situational awareness to the impacted region, which can in turn uh, provide local and on the ground partners with information on potential options for available water supply. Uh, businesses can then work towards resuming normal operations and provide their goods and services to the community. Uh, during steady state, the OB3I operates the MBOC service desk as a connection point for businesses to access FEMA resources and information. Uh, when not engaged in active disaster response operations, the MBOC focuses on business and economic information and trends to develop predictive analysis related to supply chain vulnerabilities and hold targeted conversations with stakeholders to learn more about the resources and capabilities they can offer uh, post-disaster. Our steady state work of the MBOC helps build the knowledge and capacity that is applied during disaster response operation. Uh, some examples of our cross-business partnerships are to provide more detail on early work OB3 undertook with federal uh, partners. Uh, an example of this uh, that we used or that we experienced during the COVID pandemic was uh, working closely with the uh, United States Postal Service uh, in the pandemic. Uh, we work closely with uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human, Human Services and the U.S. Postal, Ser Postal Service when trying to get uh, protective masks and, and, and cloth masks out to the millions of affected uh, uh, people in the United States population. ESF-14 was activated and the team focused on working with business and industry partners, specifically DHS's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and FEMA OB3I uh, work closely to identify street, ad street addresses of critical infrastructure operations across the sectors in hard hit communities across the country. Uh, the first hit areas that received priority for mass shipments included Louisiana, New Jersey, New York, and Washington. We provided these addresses to FEMA Logistics Operations and the United States Postal Service so that 30 million cloth masks could be distributed to critical infrastructure workers and to help these businesses and infrastructure entities return to work safely. 
Uh, this is just one example of the many efforts where ESF 14 worked collectively with our federal agency partners to meet the nation's needs. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, I will turn over to Ms. back to Mr. Rutledge to uh, give an overview of the way forward uh, and resources and questions. Uh, Bob, back to you. Great, thanks, Ron. Uh, folks, there's one thing that uh, Ron touched on that I'd just like to uh, reemphasize. Um, ESF 14, the, the team that composes ESF 14, Ron's group over at FEMA and my group over at uh, CISA, we're there all the time. And we work incidences collaboratively that don't rise up to the level of a national response. So we may not have an activation for ESF-14 for like a hurricane or something like that. If we have a regional impact or local impact, if someone still reaches out to us, we work together to address that issue. And Ron, Ron touched on this in, in his comments a few moments ago, and that by continuing to help out with private sector infrastructure and business issues that are, um, not on a national level, but at a regional level or local level, we're not only building contacts and networks for when there is a national response, but we're also getting that experience for the teams that that are working so that we're, we can do our job just a little bit better when the next full-blown activation occurs. So I, I don't want you all to think that ESF-14 only exists during a national declared response operation. FEMA activates the ESFs when something big happens, but the reality of it is the team that staffs ESF-14, it's, it's our daily job. So we are there to support for any issues. Uh, one thing that I was working on about a year ago was a, a potential chlorine shortage in the Southwestern US for water and drinking water and wastewater. That didn't rise to the national level um, for FEMA to activate the ESFs, but the office I work in and where Ron works, we work together to get some ground truth on what exactly was happening with chlorine shipments and some of the water and wastewater facilities in the southwestern U.S. So I just wanted to make sure I emphasize that. So the final slide, we're almost there. Um, ESF 14 way forward resources for you, and we want to leave some time for questions if you have any. So again, relatively new emergency support function, although you know, we created in October of 2019. By February 2020, we were right running into the, the global pandemic. So uh, we got off to a, a very busy running start. So we're seasoned, but we're still relatively new and certainly newer than the others. So we're going to, our next steps are to continue to focus on developing our networks and enhance the existing relationships that we have so we can continue to build collaborative relationships with business and industry partners so we're in a better position to team up during response operations. And we're going to work with organizations such as the All Hazards Consortium, the National Council of Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, um, other private organizations that we already have working relationships with so we can find ways to better bring everybody together when it's time to react to a uh, disaster. We also are still working to identify associ associations that are out there, both public and private entities, th that we don't know exist yet. So we're still working to expand our network. And finally, because we've been kind of busy since uh, our inception, um, we haven't had a whole lot of time to work on the documents that support the organization, such as the concept of operations, the training plan, standard operating procedures. So we're finally putting the finishing touches on those. So points of contact. We have a whole bunch of email addresses, but we thought, Ron and I were talking about this, we thought it would be best to just use one email address so when folks need to reach out to us, you don't have to think to yourself, well, am I asking a FEMA question or am I asking a CISA question? 
just use our one email address and we will triage it and get it into the hands um, that it needs to be in. So whether it's a comment, concern, or a need, just reach out to us at ESF14 at CISA.DHS.GOV. And that email box is monitored at least five days a week during normal business hours. During activations, it's monitored 24-7. There's a couple of resources available for you. You can reach out. You can go onto the World Wide Web and go to CISA.gov. And that's got all kinds of information on ransomware, cyber hygiene services, some joint agency announcements, usually about cyber stuff. And um, there's um, some cyber tools there that you can use as well. Uh, you can go to the NBEOC website at fema.gov forward slash NBEOC and get information about Ron's group and the NBEOC. You can also go visit the NBEOC dashboard, which is at fema.connectsolutions.com forward slash NBEOC. And you can take a look at that online resource. It is available 24-7 and get a feel for what it looks like. I uh, highly recommend at least taking a glance at it before we get into our next response operation. And that concludes our briefing. Uh, Ron and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. And uh, many, many thanks to the All Hazards Consortium for inviting us to present today. Thank you very much. Hey, gentlemen, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, so you actually took kind of the wind out of one of my sales. I was going to ask you the question with you two gentlemen being cooks in the kitchen is where you see ESF 14 going in the future. Uh, it's, you know, it's not supposed to be an ESF, uh, for, you know, a super cell or super ESF, but uh, do you have any visions of the future? You think uh, where would you really like to see it go aside from the resources you're looking for and uh, to expand your, your footprint and your relationships and the like, anything exciting? Well, it's Ron's team and my team talk about this quite a bit. The, the scope, the potential, well, the actual scope of ESF-14 is exceptionally broad. And we could, one minute we could be dealing with, uh, like the examples uh, presented here, with railroad issues. And the next minute we're dealing, we're helping ESF-2 national communications with a comms issue. Or we're looking at things in food and agriculture or the chemical sector. It literally is a broad spectrum that we're expected to cover. So one of the things that we're working on for our internal resources is we're trying to grow our teams. Um, we have uh, very uh, significant challenges when it comes to staffing. Um, we're working on that and uh, we're hoping that uh, over the next couple of years, we can have a pretty robust um, engine here that can help during steady state as well as during response ops. Uh, Ron, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, not uh, in the same tracks as Bob mentioned, right? It's it's increasing our our capabilities and then working collectively inside of the agency to uh, ensure that we are harnessing uh, access to resources. Um, you know, not just in the programmatic channels, but holistically throughout the agency to be better uh, congealed and to uh, align with the with who's doing what work to make sure that we're not being duplicative and that we are that we are uh, getting aligned in the correct lines of effort um, within the again within the agency to ensure that we're we're covering the the, the one to end spectrum as it relates to both public and private industry partners and to increase relationships with them, those partners uh, throughout the year. That's one of the big focal points for us this year is, is galvanizing with our business and industry partners and doing a, a real holistic effort as far as aligning with our community lifeline partners and getting those, those folks aggregated into, into what we call cohort groups um, to consistently engage with them because as as we mentioned I'll circle all the way Dell to what you said at the beginning of the of the call right it's it's all about relationships right it's all about the people that we know and it's having those those relationships with those organizations and that when we reach out to them <clears throat> and we reach out to them not only during bad times but in good times so that we can level set 
and and set expectations for some of the information that we're going to be looking for when we do get into disasters and we do get into bad times, right? Um, and that those key resources and those partners will answer the call when we when we're reaching out for information, right? Because it's all about it's all about trusted partnerships, and we value those partnerships with our partners. And again, uh, them being able to to uh, cross communicate with us when when things are at at their worst is when it's most important for us. And so we 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 value that, and and we're working again to align those those uh, those efforts and working again collectively with the groups in the in the in the private sector to better understand our partner base and to also understand uh their capabilities and 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 how they're working so that we can we can better uh support them as well terrific yeah i really really do appreciate the insights there and i believe it was one of the directors yesterday that said inside of uh his organization he was given access to any resources needed internally and having been fortunate enough to walk the halls of FEMA and CISA for many years, uh, you have some of the brightest minds in the industry and for you to be able, even internally, it's about relationships, to be able to walk down the hall. If you need somebody who really can specialize in Excel spreadsheets and onboarding people into systems and so on and so on, you've got some of the best in the business and having those resources, they don't necessarily have to be your day-to-day -day staff, but to be able to go out there, tap somebody and say, hey, I really need some help here. You guys have great opportunities is the way it looks. Um, so we do have a question that came in uh, from Everett and Ron. This was directed towards you. So ESF 14 dashboard is on an ArcGIS online. If our agency has an Esri Enterprise account and access to ArcGIS on, GIS online, excuse me, uh, should we be able to see this dashboard? If they've already got the tool and enterprise tool, can they see the dashboard and get access to the information? So the the MBOC dashboard is a is an Adobe Connect. That's a it's an open URL that we share with our stakeholders. So you do you do not need a, a Arc GIS account to to see that. Um, what you and then we also uh, on FEMA.gov there are what is called the Hurricane Journal. That is a different is a a multitude of of dashboards that that anybody can access, they're open. They're open to the public, and so there is no ArcGIS uh, account required for that. Um, so, and I and I'll look really quick here while while you're on the line, and I can get the the URL for that, and I can put it in the chat. So, if you can just give me a couple seconds, I'll dig that up real quick. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be terrific. And I also know that you have a GIS team that's really leading edge. I think it's under Chris Vaughn or whomever, but that, that has some really amazing products that they uh, put together as well. Um, perhaps we could do this while you're looking that up. I hear that uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, there's a really short uh, video that they wanted to, uh, to put up here. Um, and maybe you can put the uh, the link in the chat as soon as you have an opportunity, if people care to stay tuned here. Yeah, Dan, we'll go ahead and start that video. And also wanted to let people know what's coming up at 1.30 p.m. So on the screen, you see your um, choice for tracks in this track or this Zoom link you're on now. At 1.30, we'll have coordinating with external sectors and states. Um, and if you wanna move to track two, just visit um, ahc2023.com where you can find the link for track two, which is our extreme weather track. And at 1.30, they're focusing on wildfires. So we'll go ahead and let's, uh, start our video. We're gonna start back up with our session content here at 1.30. I'd like to personally thank uh, Ron and Bob for your participation this morning um, on, on this summit. We really appreciate the information and our longtime partnership with both of you. <laughs> Del, Del, I put the I, I put the link in the in the chat and I think I can only send it to you so it's it's in there if you want to repopulate that okay perfect I'll make sure that it gets into the broader distribution thank you Great. so much and, and thank you, echoing, sir. echoing Laura thank you so much very very informative this morning folks and keep doing such a great job thank you back to you Laura thanks Laura
What's the big idea? So the cross sector exercise is really designed to nail down six areas of information that hundreds of people search for in every hurricane. The idea was, can we narrow what, down what those six things are? Three for state government, three for industry, uh, and then bring about a process we can all work together and coordinate to synchronize information on these things, right? So it is virtual, so we can have lots of participation. And of course, we're focusing on Hurricane Ida. Within the sites, we capture the morning, noon, and evening snapshots throughout the, the hurricane season and winter storm season. And that data is stored within the sites. We you'll see on the right side of the screen, you'll see the data from Ida. This is the weather, road closure, decks, waivers, status of information, all across those days that we captured the data. Uh, today, we're going to focus on minus 48 hours and plus 48 hours as part of the exercise. But the outcomes of the exercise are very simple. We produce a playbook, which will improve every year. We will produce a directory of people. We will set contacts up on email notifications. We'll, we'll test script for a, a operational coordination call, invitation only, cross sector with states to, you know, 20 minutes, highly scripted, following North Carolina's process. Of course, we'll have our data library and tools and resources to support that as well. So the whole purpose of this is to synchronize information on six areas of information that are, we know are, are critical uh, for every hurricane. This exercise is powered by the collaborative effort of the amazing experts you're gonna hear today and state folks, the size and people from our group, which is the Private Sector Liaison Committee for the All Hazards. So although I work for North Carolina, I work closely with the All Hazards Consortium because they're just, you know, they're fun. They get things done. And that's why we're all here. So everyone who does operations with disaster management or Jason and all of you who work in this industry, we do exercises all the time, year in, year out, over and over, again and again, every year. And in this industry that involves public-private partnerships, the dream is exercise together, right? That's what we want. But unfortunately, we don't get that chance all the time. And to exercise in real time with real events, with people that are owner operators. So this dream to do this is here. So I like to call this the new age of exercise, what we're doing today and what we did last year. And I know that it's gonna be fantastic. So there's no theory. This is more like a dress rehearsal for this coming season. And uh, so I love that. So welcome to this uh, new age and get ready, Ron. All right, and here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're in the process of welcoming, talking about participants. We can do some housekeeping. Then we will quickly dive into a mock before Hurricane Ida uh, cross-sector call. We wanna test that process out to see how well it works. Then we'll jump into looking at before Hurricane Ida data and systems identification. Take a real quick five minute break, bio break, uh, get back together. The hurricane will have moved through and will be 48 plus hours out. And we will look at the mock after Hurricane Ida. And we'll definitely want your input on that agenda and how well it works. Uh, then we will go into after Hurricane Ida data and systems identification. Uh, have a quick after action session and then tom we will do a recap and next steps tom mentioned we're looking at 48 hours before and 48 hours after these are the different phases that we've identified and as tom said last year we went through three different sessions so we went through phase zero and one then went through phase two and three and then went through phase four and five so you got to get your mind in before the break you're at minus 48 hours from impact of hurricane Ida, and after the break you're at plus 48 hours uh, post impact. Oh. That was not uh, not that great. Um, so we have uh, Ida that has developed in the Caribbean. Uh, Ida currently has winds of 80 miles per hour and is about to make landfall on the western tip of Cuba. Uh, the latest uh, National Hurricane Center forecast uh, has Ida strengthening to a major hurricane prior to landfall in the state of Louisiana. You, uh, I want to show you the uh, water temperatures are very warm in the Gulf of Mexico. Potentially impacted states first, we'll talk with Jim Williams. Jim, you want to give us an update as to what's going on in Louisiana regarding declarations, waivers, and uh, any alerts and updates for Louisiana, please. Hey, good morning, everyone. And um, The state declaration was signed by the governor uh, as of the 26th of August. Uh, right now, we have 48 parishes that have declared at this time, two in progress. All right, we're going to go to the other potential impacted states by exception. Uh, we'll go to Texas first. Um, anything to report, uh, uh, Randy? Yeah, at this time, uh, the path is still uh, not firmed up completely, and it's on-staff meteorologist has it east um, of the initial strike point. So, uh, Todd, any uh, anything to report? Um, by exception basis, anything different than what we've heard so far? 
Uh, just a little bit to add, uh, as, as just like Texas, uh, we're going to be on the edge of the cone of error, if you will, uh, which is close enough to make us incredibly anxious. So uh, we're going to position uh, and posture like it's going to hit us. So. Good morning. This is Alex from Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Based upon uh, the 48 hour out uh, call on the Tri-Key Nevada, FMCSA has compiled an emergency declaration that consists of 15 states. The states will be Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Arkansas, Oklahoma. We're going to move back to the uh, private sector communications. Ken Kilbeth. Good morning, everyone. Uh, three quick updates for this team. We are.